You may recognize our next speaker from somewhere. She was here earlier on our panel. She's known for her work with the New York City Skeptics their, and their podcast, Rationally Speaking. And she's also the co-author of the philosophy blog, Measure of Doubt, with her brother, Jesse, Julia Galef. Hey, it's really nice to be back. I'm so excited to be giving a talk at Skepticon. Last year was my first Skepticon, and I got to moderate a panel. Um, so this is an exciting new step for me. No? Oh, all right. Um, is that better? Yeah. Oh, great. All right, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> so, my talk today has been sort of organically growing over the last couple of years as I've become more and more involved in the skeptic and rationality movements, and I've gotten more and more practice and learned many lessons the hard way about communicating ideas about rationality and critical thinking and skepticism to people. So, the title of the talk is the straw Vulcan. How Hollywood's illogical view, or Hollywood's illogical view of logical decision making. So this, if there's anyone in the audience who doesn't recognize this face, this is Mr. Spock. <laughs> Someone's raising their hands, but it's a Vulcan salute, so I don't believe you don't know him. So this is Mr. Spock. He's, uh, he's one of the main characters on uh, Star Trek, and and he's the, uh, the first officer and the science officer on the Starship Enterprise. His mother is human, but his father is Vulcan. So the Vulcans are this race of aliens that are known for trying to live in strict adherence to the rules of region, reason and logic, and also for eschewing emotion. So it's, this is something I wasn't actually clear on as I was remembering the show from my childhood. It's not that they, the Vulcans don't have emotion, it's just that over time they've developed very strict and successful ways of transcending and suppressing their emotions. So Spock being half Vulcan has more lapses than a, uh, a pure blood Vulcan, um, but still on the show Star Trek he is the logical character and that, uh, that makes up a lot of the, um, the inter-character dynamics and the storylines on the show. So here's Spock, here are the Vulcans, and I, I ask this question, Vulcans, rational aliens, with a question mark, because the brand of rationality that's practiced by Spock and, and his fellow Vulcans isn't actually rationality, and that's what my talk is going to be about today. So this term, straw Vulcan, I wish I could personally take credit for it, but I borrowed it from a website called TV Tropes, which is this delightful, yes, TV Tropes, some of the highest level rationality that, one, that I can find on the internet, let alone on another pop culture like television blog. Um, I highly recommend you check it out. So the term, they coined the term straw Vulcan to refer to the type of fictional character who's supposed to be the logical one or the rational one, but his, his brand of rationality is this, it's not real rationality, it's sort of this caricature, this like weak, gimpy caricature of rationality that, well, essentially, you would think if someone's genuinely super rational that they'd be running circles around all the other characters in the, in the TV show or in the movie, but because it's this sort of fake rationality that's, that's designed to demonstrate that the real success, the real route to glory and, and happiness and fulfillment is all of these things that people consider to make us essentially human, like our passion and our, our uh, emotion and our intuition and, yes, our irrationality. And since that, that's the point of the character, his brand of irrationality is, is this sort of woeful character. And so that's why it's called a straw Vulcan. Because if you're, if you're arguing against some viewpoint that you disagree with, and you caricature that viewpoint in as simplistic and exaggerated a way as possible to make it easy for yourself to just knock it down and pretend that you've knocked that entire uh, viewpoint down, that's a straw man. So, so these are straw Vulcans. So as I was saying, Spock and his fellow straw Vulcans played this role in their respective uh, TV shows and movies of seeming like the character who should be able to save the day, but in practice, the day usually gets saved by someone like this. <laughs> yep, I'm sorry, I can't hear you over the sound of how awesome I am. <laughs> so, so my talk today is going to be about straw Vulcan rationality and how it diverges from actual rationality. And I think this is an important subject because 
So it's possible that many of you in the audience have some misconceptions about rationality that, uh, that have been shaped by these straw Vulcan characters, which are so prevalent. And even if you hadn't, haven't, it's really useful to understand the concepts that are in people's minds when you talk to them about rationality. Because as I've learned the hard way again and again, even if it's so clear in your mind that rationality can make your life better and can make the world better, if people are thinking of straw Vulcan rationality, you're, you're never going to have any impact on them. So it's really useful to understand the differences between what you're thinking of and what many other people are thinking of when they talk about rationality. So first what I'm going to do is define what I mean by rationality. So this is actual rationality. I'm just defining this here because I'm going to refer back to it throughout my talk, so I want you to know what I'm talking about. So there's two forms of, uh, or two concepts that we use the word rationality to refer to. One of them is sometimes called epistemic rationality, and it's the method of obtaining an accurate view of reality, essentially. So the method of reasoning and, and collecting evidence about the world and updating your beliefs so as to make them as, as true as possible, as hewing as closely to what's actually out there, what's actually happening as possible. And then the other sense of the word rationality that we use is instrumental rationality. So this is the method for achieving your goals, whatever they are. They could be selfish goals, they could be altruistic goals, just whatever you care about and want to achieve, instrumental rationality is defined as the method that's most likely to help you achieve them. And obviously they're related. Um, it helps to have an accurate view of reality if you want to achieve your goals, with very few exceptions. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. I just want to define the concepts for you. So this is the first principle of straw Vulcan rationality. Being rational means expecting other people to be rational too. So this is the sort of thing that tends to trip up a straw Vulcan. Um, and I'm going to give you an example. Okay, so this, this scene that's about to take place uh, there's uh, the, the Star Trek, sorry, the Starship's shuttle has just crash landed on this potentially hostile alien planet. Mr. Spock is in charge, and he's he's come up with this very rational plan in his mind um, in, that is going to help them escape the wrath of the uh, potentially aggressive aliens. So they're going to display their superior force. And then the aliens are going to see that, and they're going to think rationally, oh, well, they have more force than we do, and so it would be against our best interests to fight back, and therefore we won't. And so this is what Spock does, and it goes awry because the aliens are angered by the display of aggression, and they strike back. So uh, this scene is taking place between Spock and McCoy, who is like Spock's foil. He's the very emotional, passion and intuition-driven uh, doctor on the ship. Oh, no. OK, I'll have to click it manually. Mr. Spock, they didn't stay frightened very long, did they? A most illogical reaction. When we demonstrated our superior weapons, they should have fled. You mean they should have respected us? Of course. Mr. Spock, respect is a rational process. Did it ever occur to you they might react emotionally? With anger? Doctor, I'm not responsible for their unpredictability. They were perfectly predictable to anyone with feeling. You might as well admit it, Mr. Spock. Your precious logic brought them down on us. So you see what happens when you try to be logical. People die, OK? <laughs> Except, of course, that exactly the opposite. Like, this is irrationality, not rationality. Rationality is about having as accurate a view of the world as possible, um, and also about achieving your goals. And clearly, Spock has persistent evidence accumulated again and again over time that other people are not actually perfectly rational, and he's just willfully neglecting the evidence. That's the exact opposite of epistemic rationality. And of course, it also leads to the opposite of instrumental rationality, too, because if people behave constantly the opposite of what you expect them to, you can't possibly make decisions that are going to be uh, achieving your goals. So the, um, this concept of rationality, or, or this particular tenet of straw Vulcan rationality, can be found outside of Star Trek as well. Uh, I was sort of surprised at the prevalence of that, but I'll give you an example. This was an article earlier this year in Info World, and basically the article is making the argument that one of the big problems with Google and Microsoft and Facebook is that the engineers there don't really understand that their customers don't have the same worldview and values and preferences that they do. 
So for example, if you remember the debacle that was Google Buzz, uh, it was a huge privacy disaster because it signed you up automatically, and then as soon as you were signed up, all of your close personal contacts, like the friends that you emailed the most, suddenly got broadcast publicly to all your other friends. So the author of this article was arguing that, well, people at Google don't care about privacy, and so it didn't occur to them that other people in the world would actually care about privacy. And so there's nothing wrong with that argument. That's a fine point to make, except he titled the article, Google's biggest problem is that it's too rational, which is exactly the same problem. I mean, it's, they're too straw Vulcan rational, which is irrational. Um, this is another uh, example from a, a friend of mine who's also a skeptic writer and author uh, of several really good books. This is Dan Gardner. He wrote Future Babble. And he's spoken at the Northeast Conference on Science and Skepticism, uh, where I've also moderated and organized last year. And he's great. He's really smart. Um, but on his blog, I found this article that he wrote about how he was criticizing an economist who was making the argument that the best way to fight crime would be to make harsher penalties, because that would be a deterrent, and that would reduce crime, because people respond to incentives. And Dan said, well, but that would make sense, except that the empirical evidence shows that people's crime rates don't actually respond nearly as much to deterrent incentives as we think they do. And so this economist is failing to update his model of how, people how he thinks people should behave based on how the evidence suggests they actually do behave. Which again is fine, except he, his conclusion was, don't be too rational about crime policy. So it's exact, exactly the same kind of thinking. And I mean, it's, it's sort of a semantic point in that he's defining rationality in this weird way, although I'm not disagreeing with his actual argument. But it's this kind of thinking about rationality that can actually be detrimental in the long run. So this is the second principle of straw Vulcan rationality. Being rational means that you should never make a decision until you have all of the information. I'll give you an example. So I couldn't find a clip of this, unfortunately. Um, but this scene takes place in an episode called The Immunity Syndrome in season two. And basically, people on the Starship Enterprise are falling ill mysteriously in droves, and there's this weird high-pitched sound that they're all experiencing that's making them nauseated. And Kirk and Spock see this big black blob on their screen, and they don't know what it is. Uh, it turns out it's a giant space amoeba, of course. And so. <laughs> But at this point, early on in the episode, they don't really know much about it. And so Kirk turns to Spock for, uh, for in input, for advice, for his opinion on what he thinks it is and what they should do. And Spock's response is, I have no analysis due to insufficient information. The computers contain nothing on this phenomenon. It is beyond our experience. And the new information is not yet significant. So that's, it's great to be uh, loath, to be hesitant, to make a decision based on, on small amounts of evidence, evidence that isn't yet significant, if you have a reasonable amount of time. But there are snap judgments that need to be made all the time when you have to decide between, between paying the cost of all of the uh, additional information that you want, and that cost could be in time or in money or in risk, if waiting is, is forcing you to incur more risk, um, or just acting based on what you have at the moment. And so, the rational approach, what a rationalist wants to do, is to maximize his, essentially, to make sure he has the best possible expected outcome. And so the way to do that is not to always wait until you have all the information, it's to weigh the cost of the information against how much you think you're going to benefit from getting that information. And we all know this intuitively in other areas of life. Like, you, you don't want the best sandwich you can get, you want the best sandwich relative to what you have to pay for it. So you'd be willing to spend an extra dollar for, you know, to make your sandwich a lot better. But if you had to spend $300 to make your sandwich slightly better, that wouldn't be worth it. You wouldn't actually be optimizing if you paid those $300 to make your sandwich slightly better. Um, and again, this phenomenon, this interpretation of rationality, I found outside of Star Trek as well. So uh, Gerd Gigerenzer is a psychologist, very well-respected psychologist. But this is him describing how a rational actor would find a wife. He would have to look at the probabilities of various consequences of marrying each of them, whether the woman would still talk to him after they're married, whether she'd take care of their children, whatever is important to him, and the utilities of each of these, 
After many years of research, he'd probably find out that his final choice had already married another person who didn't do these computations and actually just fell in love with her. So, Gerd Gigerenzer is a big critic of the idea of rational decision making. Um, but as far as I've been able to tell, one of the main reasons he's a critic is that this is how he defines rational decision making. And clearly, this isn't actually optimal decision making. Clearly, someone who is actually interested in maximizing their, their eventual outcome would take into account the fact that doing years of research would limit the number of women who would still be available and actually interested in dating you after all of that research was said and done. So this is straw Vulcan rationality principle number three. Being rational means never relying on intuition. So here's an example. This is uh, that's Captain Kirk. This is in the original series. And he and Spock are uh, playing a game of three-dimensional chess. No. Wait. Checkmate, he said. <laughs> Your illogical approach to chess does have its advantages on occasion, Captain. <laughs> um, let me just check my sound. Maximize my long-term expected outcome in this presentation by incurring a short-term cost. Uh, sorry? Yes, thank you. All right, well, I we'll hope that doesn't happen again. Um, anyway, so, so clearly, an approach that causes you to win at chess cannot by any sensible definition be called an illogical way of playing chess. Um, so, so, but from the perspective of straw Vulcan rationality, it can, because anything intuition-based is illogical in straw Vulcan rationality. So there are essentially there are two systems that people use to make decisions. They're rather boringly called system one and system two, but they're more colloquially known as the intuitive system of reasoning and the deliberative system of reasoning. So the intuitive system of reasoning is an older system. Uh, it allows us to make automatic judgments, to make judgments using shortcuts, which are sometimes known as heuristics. So they're sort of useful rules of thumb for what's going to work that don't always work, but, but they're sort of good enough most of the time. They don't require a whole lot of cognitive processing ability or memory or, um, or you know, time or attention. And then system two, the deliberative system of reasoning, is much more recently evolved. It takes a lot more cognitive resources, a lot more attention, um, but it allows us to do abstract hypothetical thinking. It allows us to construct models of what might happen when it's something that hasn't happened before, whereas, say, a system one approach would decide what to do based on how things have happened in the past. Um, so system two is, is much more useful when you can't actually safely rely on precedent and you have to actually think what are the possible future scenarios and what would likely happen if I behaved in a certain way in each of those scenarios. So that's system two. Um, so system one is more prone to bias. Uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky gave, gave a great talk earlier this morning about some of the biases that we can fall prey to, um, especially when we're engaging in system one reasoning. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's always the wrong system to use. So I'll give you, well, I'll give you a couple examples of system one reasoning for, um, before I go any farther. So there's a, a problem that logician, or that logic teachers sometimes give to their students. Uh, it's a very simple problem. And they say, OK, a bat and a ball together add up to $1.10, the cost of the, of the two items. Um, the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? And the intuitive system one answer to that question is 10 cents, because you look at a dollar 10 and you look at a dollar and you take away a dollar and you get 10 cents. Um, but if the ball were actually 10 cents and the bat were a dollar, then the bat would not cost a dollar more than the ball. So essentially, that's the kind of answer you get when you're not really thinking about the problem. You're just sort of feeling around for, well, what do problems like this generally involve? Well, you generally like take one thing away from another thing, so why don't I do that? Um, and in fact, when this problem was given to a class at Princeton, 50% of them got 
the wrong answer. So it just shows how, how quickly we reach for our system one reasoning and how rarely we feel a need to actually go back and check in a, in a deliberative fashion. Uh, another example of system one reasoning that I really like is, uh, you may have heard about this classic social psychology experiment in which researchers uh, sent someone to wait in line at a copy machine and they asked the person ahead of them, oh, excuse me, do you mind if I cut in line? And maybe about 50%, maybe 40% of them agreed that to let the, uh, the experimenter's plant cut in line ahead of them. But when the experimenter redid this, the study, and this time, instead of saying, can I cut in front of you, said, can I cut in front of you because I need to make copies? Then the agreement rate went up to like 99%, something really high. And there's literally, like, of course they need to make copies. That's the only reason they would want to cut in line to get to the copy machine, except because the request is phrased in terms of giving a reason, our system one uh, reasoning kicks in, and we go, oh, well, they have a reason. So, sure, <laughs> you have a reason. <laughs> so, system one and system two have their pros and cons in different contexts. Uh, system one is especially good when you have a short time span, a limited amount of resources, and attention to devote to a problem. Uh, it's also good when you, have, you know that you have experience and memory that's relevant to the question, but it's not that easily accessible. Like, you've had a lot of experiences with things like this problem, but our memories aren't stored in this, in this easy list where we can sort by, you know, according to keywords and, and uh, find the mean of the you know, number of uh, items in our, in our memory base. So you have information in there, and, and really the only way to access it sometimes is to rely on your intuition. Um, it's also helpful when there are important factors that go into your decision that are hard to quantify. So there are a number of recent studies that have been exploring when system one reasoning is, is successful, and it tends to be successful when people are making purchasing decisions or uh, other choices about their personal life, and there are a lot of factors involved, like there's dozens of factors relevant to what car you buy that you could consider. Um, but a lot of what makes you eventually happy with your purchase or your choice is just your personal liking of the car. And that's not the sort of thing that's easy to quantify, at least when people try to think about using their system two reasoning, they don't really know how to quantify their, their liking of the car. And so when they, when they rely on system two, they often tend to just look at, at you know, the mileage and the cost and all these other things, which are important, but they don't really get at that, at that emotional uh, uh, preference about the car. So that kind of information can, can be helpfully drawn out by system one reasoning. Um, also, if you're an expert in a field, like say chess, for example, uh, you, can, you can easily win over someone who's using careful deliberative reasoning just based on all of your experience and you've built up this incredible pattern recognition uh, ability with chess. So a, a chess master can just walk past a chessboard, glance at it and say, oh, white's going to checkmate black in three moves. Or chess masters can play multiple, many, many different chess games at once and win them all. Uh, I mean, and obviously they don't have the cognitive resources available to devote to, to each game fully, but their, their automatic pattern recognition system that they've built up over thousands and thousands of chess games is, works just well enough. Um, intuition is bad, it's, it's less reliable. Uh, in cases where the kinds of heuristics or the kinds of biases that Eliezer spoke about earlier are relevant or when you have a good reason to believe that your intuition was based on something that isn't actually relevant to the task at hand. So if you're using your intuition to decide how likely, say, uh, work on artificial intelligence is going to be to lead to some global disaster, you might rely on your intuition, but you also have to think about the fact that your intuition in this case was probably shaped by fiction. Um, <laughs> there are a lot more interesting stories of robot apocalypses and AI explosions that that took over the world than there are stories of AI actually going in a, a nice, boring, pleasant way. So, so that, like being able to recognize where your intuition comes from can help you decide when it's a good guide in a particular context. Uh, system two is, tends to be better when you have more resources and more time. Um, it's also good, as I mentioned, in new and unprecedented situations, uh, new and unprecedented decision-making contexts where you can't just rely on, on pattern matching of what's worked in the past. So, uh, a problem like global warming or um, a problem like other existential risks that, that face our, our, our world, um, our species, 
uh, the potential for nuclear war. We don't really have precedents to draw on, so it's hard to think that we could rely on our intuition to tell us what's going to happen or what we should do. Um, and system two tends to be worse when there are many, many factors to consider, and we don't have the cognitive ability to uh, consider them all fairly. Um, but the reason, the, the, the main takeaway of all of the system one and system two comparison is that both systems have their strengths and weaknesses, and rationality, rationality is about trying to find the, the truest path to, to an accurate picture of reality, and it's about trying to find what actually maximizes your, your own happiness or whatever goal you have. And so what you do is you don't rely on one or the other uh, blindly. You decide, based on this context, which method is going to be the most likely to get me what I want, the truth, or whatever other goals I have. And I think that a lot of the times that you hear people say that it's possible to be too rational, what they're really talking about is that it's possible to use system two deliberative reasoning in contexts where it's inappropriate or to use it poorly. So here's a real life example. This is the headline of an article that came out earlier this year. So if you can't read it, it says, is the teen brain too rational? And the argument of the article, it was actually a, a study, and it found that teenagers, when they're deciding whether to take certain risks, like to do drugs or to, to drive above the speed limit without their, their seatbelt, they often do what is technically system two reasoning. So they'll actually think about the pros and cons or and, and think about what the risks are likely to be. But they, the reason they do it anyway is that they're really bad at the system two reasoning. They, they completely, uh, they, they poorly weigh the risks and the benefits and, and that's why they end up doing stupid things. So the conclusion that I would draw from that is teens are bad at system two reasoning. The conclusion the author drew from that is that teens are too rational. So another example, I found this quote when I was, I was Googling around for examples to use in this talk, and uh, I found this, what I thought was a, a perfect quote, uh, illustrating this principle that I'm trying to describe to you. It is therefore equally imbalanced to be mostly intuitive, i.e. ignoring one's first impressions, or ignoring that one's first impressions can be wrong, or too rational, i.e. ignoring one's hunches as surely misguided. So again, here I would say, if you ignore your hunches, blindly and assume they're misguided, then you're not being rational, you're being irrational. Um, and so I was happily copying down the quote uh, before having even looked at the author, and then I, I checked to see who the author of the post was, and uh, it's the <laughs> co-host of my podcast, Rationally Speaking, uh, Massimo Pellucci, who I uh, am very fond of and am probably going to get in trouble with now, but I couldn't pass up this perfect example, and this is just how committed I am to teaching you guys about true rationality that I will brave the wrath of that Italian man there. <laughs> so, Strubble, rationality principle number four. Being rational means not having emotions. And this is something that I, I want to focus on a lot because I think uh, the portrayal of rationality and emotion by Spock's version, by the Straw Vulcan version of rationality, is definitely confused. Um, it's definitely wrong, but I think the truth is nuanced and complicated, so I, I wanted to draw this one out a little bit more. Um, but first, a clip. Hopefully. Oh, Spock thinks the captain's dead at this point. Doctor, I shall be resigning my commission immediately, of course. A Spock. So I would appreciate your making the final arrangements. Spock, I... Doctor, please, let me finish. There can be no excuse for the crime of which I'm guilty. I intend to offer no defense. Furthermore, I shall order Mr. Scott to take immediate command of this vessel. Don't you think you better check with me first? Captain. <laughs> Jim! I'm pleased to see you, Captain. You seem uninjured. So he almost slipped up there, but he caught himself just in time. Um, hopefully none of the other Vulcans found out about it. So this is essentially the Spock model of how emotions and rationality relate to each other. You have a goal, and you use rationality, unencumbered by emotion, 
to figure out what action to take to achieve that goal. And then emotion can get in the way and screw up this process if you're not really careful. This is sort of the Spock model. And it's not, a, it's not wrong, per se. Like, emotions can clearly and frequently do screw up attempts at rational decision making. I'm sure, I'm sure you all have anecdotal examples just like I do, uh, but, but to throw some out there, if you're really angry, it can be hard to recognize the clear truth that lashing out at the person you're angry at is probably not going to be a good idea for you in the long run. Or if you're, uh, say, in love, it can be hard to recognize the ways in which you're completely incompatible with this other person and you're going to be really unhappy with them in the long run if you stay with them. Or if you're, say, disgusted and irritated by hippies, it can be hard to objectively evaluate arguments that you associate with hippies, like, say, criticisms of capitalism. Um, so these are just a few examples. And these are anecdotal examples, but there's plenty of experimental research also that demonstrates that people's rational decision-making abilities suffer when they're in states of heightened emotion. So, for example, when people are, are anxious, they overestimate risks by a lot. When people are depressed, they underestimate how much they're going to enjoy some future activity that's pr proposed to them. Um, and then there's a series of interesting recent studies by a couple psychologists named Whitson and Galinsky that demonstrate that when people are feeling threatened or vulnerable or like they don't have control, they tend to be much more superstitious. They perceive patterns where there are no patterns. They're more likely to believe conspiracy theories. Um, they're more likely to see patterns in company financial data that aren't actually there. And they're more likely to be willing to actually invest to put their money down based on these non-existent patterns that they, that they thought they saw. So, right, so Spock's not actually wrong. Um, the problem with this model is just that it's incomplete. So, and the, the reason it's incomplete is that goal box. Where does that goal box come from? It's not handed down to us from on high. It's, it's not sort of written into the fabric of the universe. The only reason that you have goals is because you have emotions, because you care about some outcomes of the world more than others, because you feel positively about some potential outcomes and negatively about other potential outcomes. Um, if you really didn't care about any potential state of the world more or less than any other potential state of the world, it wouldn't matter how, how skilled your, your reasoning abilities were, you'd never have any reason to do anything. Um, essentially, you'd just look like this. <laughs> Meh. I mean, even, even rationality for its own sake isn't really coherent without some emotion, because if you want to do rationality, if you want to be rational, it means you care more about about having the truth than you do about being ignorant. So emotions are clearly necessary for forming the goals. Um, rationality is simply uh, lame without them. But there's also some interesting evidence that, that emotions are important for making the decisions themselves. So there's a psychologist named Antonio Damasio who studies patients with brain damage to, the, um, to a certain part of their brain, the ventroparietal frontal cortex, I can't remember the name. But essentially, it's the, it's the part of the brain that's crucial in uh, reacting emotionally to one's thoughts. So the patients who suffered from this injury, they were perfectly undamaged in other ways. So they, they could perform just as well on tasks of visual perception and language processing and probabilistic reasoning and all these other forms of deliberative reasoning and other senses. But their lives very quickly fell apart after this injury because when they were making decisions, they couldn't actually simulate, they couldn't actually feel viscerally what the value was to them of the different options. So their jobs fell apart, their interpersonal relationships fell apart, and also a lot of them became inc incredibly indecisive. Like, Damasio tells a story of one patient of his who, when he left the doctor's office, Damasio gave him the choice of a pen or a wallet. So there's some cheap little wallet, whatever you want. And the patient sat there for about 20 minutes trying to decide Finally, he picked the wallet, but then when he went home, he left a message on the doctor's office voicemail saying, I changed my mind, can I come back tomorrow and take the pen instead of the wallet? And the problem is, the way we make decisions is we, we sort of query our brain to, to see how we feel about the different options, and if you can't feel, then, then you just don't know what to do. Um, so it seems like there's a strong case that emotions are essential to this, decision, this ideal decision-making process not just in forming your goals, but in actually weighing the different options uh, 
in, in, in the context of a specific decision at a time. So this is the first revision that I would make to the straw Vulcan model of ideal decision making. Um, and this is sort of the standard model of ideal decision making as, say, economics formulates it. You have your values. Economics doesn't particularly care what they are, um, but economic studies or the, the way that economics formulates a rational actor is acting, someone who acts in such a way as to maximize their chances of getting what they value, whatever that is. And again, that's, that's a pretty good model. It's, it's not a bad simplification of what's going on. But the thing about this model is that it takes your emotional desire as a given. Um, it just says, given what you desire, what's the best way to get it? And we don't have to take our desires as a given. In fact, I think this is where rationality comes back into the equation. So we can actually use rationality to think about our instinctive emotional desires and as a consequence of, of them, the things that we, that we value, our goals, and think about whether they make sense rationally. And it's a little bit of a controversial statement. Um, some psychologists and philosophers would say that emotions and desires can't be rational or irrational. You just want what you want. Um, and certainly, they can't be rational or irrational in the same way that beliefs can be rational or irrational. I mean, you can't, well, all right, some philosophers might argue with this, but I would say you can't be wrong about what you want. But I think there's still a strong case to be made for some emotions being irrational. And if you, if you think back to the two definitions of rationality I gave you earlier, there was epistemic rationality, in which, which is about making your beliefs about the world as true as possible. And there was instrumental rationality, which is about maximizing your chances of getting what you want, whatever that is. So I think that it makes sense to talk about emotions as being epistemically irrational if they're implicitly, at their core, based on a false model of the world. And this happens all the time. So, for example, you might be angry at your husband for not asking you how this presentation at work went. It was a really important presentation, and you can't believe he didn't ask you. And and that anger is, is predicated on the assumption, whether conscious or not, that he should have known this was important, that this was an important pre uh, presentation to you. But if you actually take a step back and think about it, it might be that, no, you actually never gave him any indication that this was, was important and that you were worried about it. And so then that would make that emotion irrational um, because it's based on a false model of, of reality. Or, for example, you might feel guilty about something even though, when you consciously think about it, you would have to acknowledge that you did nothing to cause it and there was nothing you could have done to prevent it. So I would, I would be inclined to call that guilt emotion also epistemically irrational. Um, or, for example, people might feel depressed because they have the, the, that's predicated on the assumption that there's nothing they can do to better their situation. And sometimes that might be true, but a lot of the time it's not. So I would call that also an irrational emotion because it's based on a false belief about your possibilities of improving whatever the problem is. So that's epistemic irrationality. And then emotions can clearly be instrumentally irrational if they're, if they're making you worse off. I mean, if something like jealousy or spite or rage or envy is unpleasant to you and it's not actually inspiring you to make any positive changes in your life and it's perhaps causing rifts with people you care about and making you less happy in that way, then I'd say that's pretty clearly uh, preventing you from achieving your goals. So emotions can be instrumentally and epistemically irrational, and using rationality is what helps us recognize that and, and shape our goals based not on what our automatic emotional desires are, but on what our rationality-filtered emotional desires are. And I, I put several emotional desires here because another role that rationality plays in this ideal decision process is in recognizing when you have conflicting desires and in weighing them against each other, deciding which is more important to you or if one of them can be changed, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, you might, you might value being the kind of person who tells the truth, but you also might value being the kind of person who's liked by people. And so you have to have some way of valuing, of weighing those two desires against each other before you decide what your goal in a particular situation actually is. So this would be my next update to the straw Vulcan model of emotion and rationality. Um, but you can actually improve it a little bit more, too. You can change your emotions using rationality. This is not that easy, um, and it often takes some time. But it's definitely something that we know how to do, at least in limited ways. 
So, for example, there's a field of psychotherapy called cognitive therapy, sometimes combined with behavioral techniques and called cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's all about their, their motto, if you can call it that, is that changing the way you think can change the way you feel. And so they have all of these techniques um, and, and like exercises that you can do to get over depression or anxiety um, or anger or other, other instrumentally and often epistemically irrational emotions. So here's an example. This is a cognitive therapy worksheet. Um, a thought record is one of the most common exercises that uh, cognitive therapy has their patients do. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's common sense, essentially. Um, it's about writing down, noting your thoughts when your emotions start to run away with you, or run away with themselves. And then stopping asking, what is the evidence that supports this thought that I have? Um, sorry, to back up, noting the thoughts that are underlying the emotions that you're feeling. So as I was talking about these sort of implicit assumptions about the world that, are, that your emotions are based on, it gets you to make those explicit. And then question whether you actually have good evidence for believing them. Um, and this, this sort of process, plus lots of other exercises that psychotherapists do with their patients and that people can even do at home by themselves from a book, is by far the most empirically validated um, and well-tested form of psychotherapy. Uh, in fact, some would say it's the only one that's really, really well supported by evidence so far. Um, and, you know, even if you're not doing an official campaign of cognitive therapy to change your emotions and, and by way of your emotions, your desires and goals, there's still plenty of informal ways for you to rationally change your emotions and make yourself better off. So, for example, uh, in the short term, you could recognize when, you're, when you feel that first spark of anger and decide whether you want to fuel the anger by dwelling on, on what that person has done in the past that angered you and imagining what they're thinking uh, about you at that moment. Or you could decide to try to, uh, to dampen the flames of your burgeoning anger by instead thinking about times that you've screwed up in the past or thinking about things that that person has done for you that were actually kind. So you do have actually a lot more conscious control if you choose to take it over which direction your emotions push you in than I think a lot of people are, are used to realizing. Um, or in the longer term, you can even change what you value. Uh, it's, it's hard, um, and it does tend to take a while. But let's say that you wish you were a more compassionate person, um, and you have conflicting desires. So one of your desires is to lie on the couch every night, and another one of your desires is to be the kind of person that other people will look up to. And so you want to bring those conflicting desires into harmony with each other. And so you, you can actually, to some extent, make yourself more compassionate over time, if that's what you want to do. You can choose to expose yourself to, uh, to material, to images, and to descriptions of suffering refugees. And you can consciously decide to imagine that it's you in that situation, or that it's your friends or family. And you can, you can do the thought experiment of asking yourself what the difference is between these people suffering and you or your friends or family suffering. And you can sort of bring the emotions about by, by thinking about situations rationally. So yeah, this, this is essentially sort of my uh, rough final model of the relationship between emotions and rationality in sort of ideal decision making, as, as distinguished from the straw Vulcan model of the relationship between emotions and rationality. So here's straw Vulcan rationality principle number five. Being rational means valuing only quantifiable things, like money, efficiency, or productivity. There's just one thing, Mr. Spock. You can't tell me that when you first saw Jim alive that you were on the verge of giving us an emotional scene that would have brought the house down. Merely my quite logical relief that Starfleet had not lost the highly proficient captain. Yes, Mr. Spock. I understand. Thank you, Captain. Of course, Mr. Spock. Your reaction was quite logical. Thank you, Doctor. And a pig's eye. Come on, Spock. Let's go mind the store. <laughs> So, so it's not acceptable in straw Vulcan rationality world to feel happiness because your best friend and captain is actually alive instead of dead. But it is acceptable to feel, well, not happiness, relief, I suppose Bach would say, did say, because 
a proficient worker in your Starfleet is actually alive and, and can therefore do more proficient work. So that, that kind of thing is rationally justifiable from the Straw Vulcan model of how rationality works. Um, here's another example. This is from an episode called This Side of Paradise. And in this episode, Spock, they're visiting a, a planet where there are these spores, or these flowers that release spores, where if you inhale them, you suddenly get really emotional. So this woman who has a crush on Spock um, makes sure to position him in front of one of the spores when, or flowers when it opens and releases its spores. So all of a sudden, he's actually romantic and emotional. So this is um, uh, Kirk and some of the rest of the crew trying to get in touch with him while he's out frolicking in the meadow with his uh, lady love. Oh, I have to press the menu. Spock. That one looks like a dragon. See the tail and the dorsal spines. I've never seen a dragon. I have. On Barangaria 7. But I've never stopped to look at clouds before. Or rainbows. Do you know I can tell you exactly why one appears in the sky? But considering its beauty has always been out of the question. So, this model of rationality, in which the only rational things to value are quantifiable things that, that don't have to do with love or joy or beauty, I've been trying to figure out where this came from. Uh, one of my theories is that it, it comes from the, the way that ec economists talk about rationality, where a rational actor maximizes his expected monetary gain. Um, and this is sort of, this is a convenient proxy because in a lot of ways, money can proxy for happiness because whatever it is that you want that you think is gonna make you happy, you can often buy with money or things that are making you unhappy, you can get rid of with money. Um, it's obviously not a perfect model, but it's, it's good enough in a way that economists um, use money uh, as sort of a proxy for utility or happiness sometimes when they're, when they're modeling how a rational actor should make decisions. But no economist would, would ever in their right mind tell you that money is inherently valuable or useful. It could only, you can't eat it, you can't do anything with it. It could only be useful or valuable, worth caring about for what it can do for you. And all of these things in the Straw Vulcan model of rationality that, that they consider acceptable things to value make no sense as values in and of themselves. It makes no sense to value productivity in and of itself. Um, if, if, you, if you are not allowed to get happy about someone you, you care about being alive instead of dead, then it doesn't make any sense at all to care about productivity or efficiency. The only way that could possibly be useful to you is in, is in getting you more outcomes like the one where your best friend is alive instead of dead. So if you don't value that, then don't bother. Um, so this has, oh wait, one more example. Um, just from, from real life, if you can consider an internet message board real life, uh, I found a discussion <laughs> in which uh, people were arguing about whether it was possible to be too rational. And one of them said, well, sure it is. Uh, and they said, well, give me an example. And he said, fine, I will. And so his example was two guys driving in a car. And one of them says, oh, we need to get from here to there, so let's take this road. And the second guy says, no, but that road has all this beautiful scenery. And it has like this historic site, which is really exciting. And it might have a UFO on it. And the first guy says, no, we have to take this first road because it's 0.2 miles shorter, and we will save 0.015 liters of gas. And that was this message board commenter's model of how a rational actor would think about things. Um, so I don't actually know whether that kind of thinking is what created straw Vulcans in TV and the movies, or whether straw Vulcans is what created people's thinking about what rationality is, or it's probably some combination of the two. Um, but it's definitely a widespread conception of what rationality consists of. Um, I myself had a conversation with a friend of mine a couple years back when I was first starting to get excited about rationality and read about it and, and study it. Um, and she said, oh, that's interesting that you're interested in this because I'm trying to be less rational. And it took me a while to get to the bottom of what she actually meant by that, but it turned out that what she meant was she was trying to enjoy life more. So, and, and she thought that rationality was about valuing money and getting a good job and being productive and efficient, and she just wanted to relax and enjoy sunsets and take it easy. And, and to express that, she, she said that she wanted to be less rational. 
Um, here's one more clip of Spock and Kirk after they left that planet. Basically, um, sorry for the spoiler, guys, but, uh, but Kirk finds a way to cure Spock of the, his newfound emotions and, um, and bring him back on board as the uh, emotionless Vulcan he always was. We haven't heard much from you about Omicron SETI-3, Mr. Spock. I have little to say about it, Captain. Except that for the first time in my life, I was happy. So, yeah, I know. Oh, oh. So, I want to end on this because I think the main takeaway from, from all of this that I want to leave you guys with is if you think you're acting rationally, but you consistently keep getting the wrong answer and you consistently keep ending worse off than you could be, then the conclusion you should, should draw from that is not that rationality is bad, is that, it's that you're being bad at rationality. Um, in other words, you're doing it wrong. Thank you. I actually have no idea what time it is. Do I have time for questions or? No, did I go over? I'm sorry. Okay. Oh no, sorry. It shut off and I couldn't figure out how to turn it on. Negative four minutes. Negative four minutes, all right. Thanks for your time. <laughs>